Yo, what's up everybody? Welcome to another video on my channel today about hash GNNs. Now hash GNN is a node embedding algorithm and we are going to explore how it works and we will do so as usual alongside a very small example so that we can understand what's going on under the hood. All right, so hash GNN is a node embedding algorithm and we use node embedding algorithms to project our nodes in the graph into a lower dimensional embedding space. So we project nodes to vectors and these vectors we can use in turn for predictive analytics and yeah, advanced analytics. And so we can solve other problems like link prediction and node classification. Node embedding algorithms optimize for one particular metric, which is nodes with similar context should be close in the embedding space. So nodes which are similar in our graph should be close in the embedding space. And similar, I've quoted here because it's not entirely clear what it means, but rather every node embedding algorithm has to define how it captures node properties and how it captures the graph structure. And it goes without saying that if we use both of them, they are most powerful. Now, usually every node embedding algorithm has to define two major steps. The first one is how we sample the context of nodes. And in node to vec for example, this would be deep or random walks. And in FastRP, for example, this would be a k-step transition matrix. The second major step in every node embedding algorithm is to define a way to reduce the dimensionality without losing pairwise distances. So pairwise distance sensitive. In Notovec, for example, we do this using SGD, so stochastic gradient descent. And in FastRP, we use random projections to achieve this. HashGNN is derived from an approach called WLKNN, which stands for Wilds Filer Lehman Kernel Neural Networks. And they are basically a message passing neural network. The WLKNN runs in T iterations and in every iteration, we start with an initial node vector, which I have put here as small boxes. So you can see every node has a different color as an input vector. And then we pass these messages, the message vectors along the edges so that all connected neighbors receive the message from each node. So we end up with information from the neighboring nodes in each of our nodes in the first step. In each node, in turn, we combine the um, initial node's vector with all the neighboring vectors it has received over the edges. Finally, in the next iteration, we pass these newly calculated vectors as messages along the edges again and start a new cycle. Now, there are two things to notice about this approach. So the first thing is, after two iterations, we already have information from nodes at two hops distance in each of our nodes or more generally after k iterations we have information in our nodes which are k hops away the second thing to notice is that each iteration only depends on the result of the previous iteration and therefore we can consider this approach a markov chain now here we can see the formula for the wlknn and what we can see is that it employs three neural networks each neural network means we um, multiply our vector with a weight matrix and apply a sigma function, an activation function on it. And here we have three neural networks. And U3, for example, we use on all the neighboring nodes of V to generate a new signature vector or message vector. And then we combine all the neighboring vectors of V in the sum here. So that's an aggregation function. And put this vector, the resulting vector, into another neural network. And this basically yields the neighbor vector in each of our nodes. Then on the other side, we pass our node vector from the previous iteration, t minus one, through neural network one to generate a, no a new uh, node vector. And then we combine this node vector with the neighbor vector and pass it again through an activation function. And the result is actually the new vector for node V in iteration T. So this happens in all of our nodes in every iteration. So the clue about hash GNN is that it replaces the three neural networks we see here with three hashing schemes and therefore circumvents the model training and runs much faster. It uses a technique called min hashing, which is of the family of locality sensitive hashing techniques. Now, min hashing is defined on sets and 
estimates or approximates the jacquard similarity of two sets without comparing them directly. Now each set can be encoded as a binary vector as well by assigning each of our values in our universe, and the universe is the set containing all the possible element, elements, we assign each of the elements an index in our vector. And then we can encode a binary if the set contains the element or not. Now the Jacquard similarity of two sets is basically the intersection size of two sets over the union. So in our small example here we have set 1 and set 2. And the intersection size is simply 2 because they only overlap in elements A and D. And the union is 5 because there are a total of 5 elements in both sets present. So here the Jacquard similarity for set 1 and set 2 is 2 over 5. Now the min hashing algorithm works as follows. We generate k hash functions, in our case that's 3, uh, using this formula down here. And we have some boundaries on our parameters a, b and c, where c has to be larger than the uh, uh, size of our universe and a prime number, and a and b have to be smaller than c. And using this formula we can generate as many hash functions as we would like to have. So in our case we generate three hash functions and what we actually do is now we use these hash functions 3k to generate k permutations of our indices here. So what's actually happening is that we hash these indices so we get three permutations of them. And these permutations are random so we use the hash functions to generate randomness in our permutations. Now subsequently we can take set 1 for example and apply it as a mask. Now the min hashing works as follows. We scan through the first permutation which is generated by hash function 1 and we search for the smallest hash value, in our case that's 2. Now we use set 1 as a mask so we select the smallest hash value where there is a 1 in our set vector and if there is a 1 we take the index of the particular row and write it into the hash signature for our set for hash function 1. So for hash function 1 and set 1 we get the index 5. For hash function 2 and set 1 we would, we would scan through the hash values and search for the lowest where we have a 1 in our set vector. So the 0 doesn't have a 1, uh, the 1 doesn't have a 1, but the 2 has a 1, so that's the smallest hash value where we have a 1 in the set vector. So we would take the index which is 3. So for set1 and hash function 2 we get the number 3. And this we can repeat for hash function 3 as well and also for the other set. And we would arrive at two vectors, one for each of our sets which is three dimensional. So it has as many dimensions as we chose k to be. And we end up with the two signature vectors. Now the interesting thing about this min hashing technique is that these signature numbers they actually collide, so they have the same value, with the probability of the Jacquard similarity of our two input sets. And the intuitive explanation would be that we select k random features from our binary vectors and that these two collide is actually appropriate to the Jacquard similarity of the two sets. Okay, so let's talk about hash GNN and how it combines the two techniques to generate node embedding. We saw the formula of the weisfeller lehmann kernel neural networks before and as I said we will replace the three neural networks with three min hashing schemes. In the first iteration we start with the initial node vectors which are in binary format and we will talk about how we can binarize features in our general graph later on. But here it is important that each node is assigned the initial vector which is the feature vector in a binary format. In step one of iteration one, we would apply hash, hashing scheme three, so P3, which relates to U3, um, on all of our nodes to generate the message vector. And that's basically a min hashing scheme. In our case, we chose K to be two. So what happens is basically we randomly select two features from each of our input vectors. And down here, I have done this for node A, which is this one. And this was the initial node vector. And if we now randomly select two features, this may be the result and I just randomly selected them. And this step actually happens on all of our nodes in the graph. So in step two of iteration one, we would pass these generated message vectors along the edges to all the neighbors. 
So for our um, node A, we receive the two vectors, the green one and the blue one from the neighbors. And then we combine them, as we saw before in the formula. We combine the two, for example, using a sum of the two vectors. And then we apply hashing scheme 2, which relates to the neural network U2 and the formula from before. And we may uh, end up with this vector, which is the combination of all of the uh, neighboring message vectors for node A in this case. In the third step, we use hashing scheme one to replace neural network one, which takes as input the nodes feature vector and hashes it or basically selects two random features again. So it min hashes the node vector and then afterwards combines it with the previously generated neighboring vector. And this entire thing is the result for each node and the iteration one. So this will be the input for the next iteration. So when we start over, we would generate message vectors from these node vectors in each of the nodes. I have depicted this last step here again, and this is the resulting vector. On this slide, I have depicted where the influence for the resulting vector is coming from. So for example, this one in the second row actually has neighborhood influence. So it's, in, it's influenced by the neighboring nodes. So we can see the one is present in node B and node C in rows in the rows two and the, in the row three we have a one which is only present in the node's own feature vector in the beginning and the fifth row here actually has influence from the node's own feature vector and also the neighboring fe feature vectors okay so that's basically the uh, algorithm we saw that we have replaced the neural networks with a min hashing scheme and now there's one question left which is how can we binarize our input vectors so that we can start with binary feature vectors for each of our nodes. All right, let's say we start from our real valued graph and each of our nodes, nodes has a five dimensional real valued vector. What we wanna do is generate binary feature vectors of a different dimensionality, let's say 10. So what we wanna do is we want to transform this five dimensional real valued vector into a 10 dimensional binary vector. And what we use for that is a technique called hyperplane rounding. And what it does is we select 10 hyperplanes, each of which is a high dimensionality plane and can be described, uh, described only by its normal vector, which is basically orthogonal to the plane surface and therefore describes the plane as long as it is residing in the origin. So we use these 10 planes as binary classifiers and that's exactly what happens in a binary classification and classify our input vector 10 times, once for each hyperplane. And the classification is basically only a dot product between our feature vector and the normal vector of one hyperplane. And the dot product basically relates to the, uh, the angle between the two vectors. So if we define a threshold now, we can decide if the vector is above or below the plane using the threshold and that's basically the binary classification above means a one and below means a zero so we classify our feature vector 10 times once with each hyperplane all using the same threshold and we get a 10 dimensional vector only containing zeros and ones now we wanted to visualize this differently we could say okay here we want to generate three output dimensions so we have three hyperplanes and we therefore we generate a three-dimensional vector each could contain a zero or a one now if we look at the purple plane here we see that the first dimension in our output vector relates to this plane and everything below this plane has the value of zero and everything above the plane has the value of one so every time we cross a um, hyperplane here in this example the the value and the respective dimension actually switches over from a zero to one or from a one to zero yeah and that basically puts the last piece into place so if we have a general input graph with real valued features we would use such feature binarization um, to generate binary feature vectors for each of our nodes and then we would run our hash GNN algorithm, which will generate binary output node embeddings. Neo4j has implemented another additional step in the GDS, which you could use on your pipeline, which is the densification of the output vectors. And you can use it to transform these binary feature vector or embedding vectors back into real valued and more densely represented 
um, real valued vectors as node embeddings. Now to wrap this up, um, I've taken this table here from the original paper, which I will link in the notes below. And here you can see that the hash GNN, which is always in the, in the lowest row here, actually has quite fast execution times uh, compared to learning based node embedding algorithms. And here, for example, we have, they have executed a link prediction task using hash GNN on the Twitter data set with an data split of 90%, for example, so they use 90% as training data and 10% as test data. And here they have a very good area under curve, which is basically the precision over recall measurement. And they are having the fastest execution times here, which is not so much uh, surprisable because they're using hashing schemes instead of learning neural networks and updating many weights. So this algorithm is actually quite efficient and with using min hashing, so a locality sensitive hashing technique, they are actually introducing a trade off between yeah, efficiency and accuracy, which you have to be aware of. But I think it can be very helpful to use this algorithm in your pipeline, especially as it has been implemented in the GDS. So it's almost no effort to play around with this. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more content like this or leave some questions in the comments. And yeah, I hope to see you next time. Until then, 